Welcome to the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast, brought to you by New England Biolabs. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and I hope this podcast offers you some new perspective. Today, I'm joined by Andy Sikama, who is a research scientist in the Lohman Lab here at NEB. The Lohman Lab studies the biological function of enzymatic mechanisms of DNA ligases and nucleases, which are the enzymes that cut and paste DNA. Andy is here to talk with us about an application of cutting and pasting DNA, and that is the DNA assembly method called Golden Gate Assembly, which can be used to join many fragments of DNA in a specified order in a single reaction. Andy, thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us here in the podcast studio today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, I'm so excited you can be here because we're in the middle of our Molecular Cloning 101 series for those individuals who might be new to molecular cloning. And you're here today to talk to us about Golden Gate Assembly. So could you just tell us what Golden Gate Assembly is to start? Yeah, so Golden Gate Assembly is a restriction enzyme-based cloning method where you can assemble multiple DNA fragments in a predetermined order in a single reaction. Uh, So this is kind of in contrast to the normal type 2P restriction enzymes that are used in uh, traditional cloning, which have a palindromic recognition site. Uh, Golden Gate utilizes type 2S enzymes, which have a separate recognition and cleavage site. Uh, And that kind of allows you to generate overhangs of any sequence. And so if you carefully select the overhang sequences that you generate, you can assemble uh, even dozens of fragments into a single reaction in a specified order. That sounds really efficient. Why would someone need to use Golden Gate Assembly? So Golden Gate's really useful for uh, designing molecular systems and is really uh, frequently used in synthetic biology applications where the goal is to like mix up things like promoters, genes, tags, terminators. And so uh, by having those defined overhangs, which we usually call fusion sites, uh, kind of defined between all those different elements, you can mix and match all those parts. So you can essentially have uh, all of your promoters have the same overhangs on each end, and that allows you to just pick whichever promoter you want out of your pool, and you can can put them all together and do these big uh, kind of combinatorial screens of different parts. It's also really good for single insert cloning because you don't have to kind of go through the traditional thing of pre-digesting and then purifying your parts. You can just throw everything into one tube and do one reaction. Um, and because of that, there's a there's a cut step at the end of the assembly process that really knocks down the background. So you tend to get very low uh, empty vector backgrounds in Golden Gate reactions as well. So why would someone choose Golden Gate assembly over another molecular cloning method? So in terms of applications, there can be a lot of overlap between Golden Gate and other multi-insert methods like uh, any builder or Gibson assembly, but there are some important distinctions. Uh, Potentially the biggest is that Golden Gate has the ability to assemble many more parts in a single reaction. Um, So our work has shown that you can pretty reliably assemble up to about 30 parts with a single Golden Gate reaction. Uh, The practical limit for something like Builder or Gibson is is less than 10. Uh, So you have a lot more complexity you can do with that number of of parts. The other kind of big advantage to Golden Gate is that since it's using restriction enzymes to generate generally four nucleotide overhangs, it's really good at tolerating repetitive and structured sequences. Um, That can be really challenging with something like Builder, which generates about a 20 nucleotide single-stranded overhang. And so that can potentially fold up. You can get all kinds of weird things happening with structured and repetitive sequences there. Because the overhangs are so short with Golden Gate, you can usually get get around that. Okay, well, those sound like some real advantages. Are there there different ways of performing Golden Gate assembly, or are there different sort of variations to the method? Yeah, so Golden Gate can be used for everything from single insert cloning to multi-fragment combinatorial libraries and and anything in between. a really common way that it's done is to do these standardized hierarchical assembly methods, um, kind of referred to as like MoClo uh, type cloning, where you organize assemblies in multiple rounds. So like in the first round, you assemble individual transcriptional units. So that's like a promoter, a gene, a terminator, tags, et cetera. And then in the second round, you put multiple transcriptional units together uh, into pathways. And then you can even do a third round to make even bigger constructs. Uh, with combining three to five parts per round, you can actually get very uh, large constructs by you know, the time you do three rounds of assembly. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So you mentioned combinatorial assembly. What can you tell me about that? 
Like, why would somebody do that? And do we have any recommendations for someone who's doing that? Yeah, so Golden Gate is, is a fantastic method if you're interested in doing combinatorial assembly um, because it is very modular and has a really high fragment capacity. Um, and you can do these things all in essentially one pot. Uh, really, the, the main challenge with doing a combinatorial assembly with Golden Gate is actually finding a way to screen the library after you, you create it. So if, say you have a 10-part assembly with 10 variant of each part, um, that has actually a theoretical complexity of 10 to the 10th or 10 billion different combinations. And so you probably made the thing you want in there. The trick is is finding it. Um, so from like the, the assembly side, these things are actually fairly straightforward. You essentially just you know, design your framework assembly to make sure all your, your junctions are fixed, and then you just come up with all the variants of the parts that you want to put into it, uh, and then you uh, kind of work out the ratios that you want, put it all in a pot, assemble it, and then you, you can transform it and then try to find out how you're screening it. And that's really the challenge. So there's a lot of these large gene foundries that use these methods, um, and most of their technology is not necessarily in the assembly, it's actually in the, in the screening. I would actually say if you want to do something like this, I would work backwards from come up with a good screen first and then figure out what you want to do for the combinatorial assembly after. Mm, great advice. Are there other tools or tips that would make Golden Gate assembly easier for someone who was uh, attempting it for the first time? Yeah, so, um, so I'll cover that in a couple of different aspects. One of them and kind of the main limitation that comes up with, with Golden Gate is that you have to domesticate the sequences. Um, and domestication is kind of the, the term we use for removing the native type 2S sites from the sequence, right? So just like any restriction enzyme, you're going to see occurrences of the recognition motif in uh, the sequences that you're working with, and those have to be removed so that they can be used. Most of the enzymes that are used for Golden Gate have six base pair recognition sites, um, but we just released a new enzyme called Paxi one that has a seven uh, base recognition site. Uh, so that means that we should see approximately one quarter the number of recognition sites for Paxi one than for most enzymes. Um, and so if you know you're in positions where you you don't want to deal with domestication uh, because of your DNA sources, just having that ability to have fewer sites around is is really helpful. The other things that can be really helpful with this is the uh, any bridge tools that we've released. Um, so kind of building on our research work that allowed us to, to push the complexity of Golden Gate and you know, do things like assemble the T7 genome uh, in a single pot, uh, we created a bunch of tools that we've now released. And so they can be found kind of in, in two places. There's the uh, any bridge Golden Gate tool, which is a, a visualization tool that you can use to uh, check your assembly products, look for internal sites. Uh, it'll even suggest primers for you. There's also the ligase fidelity tools, which is uh, great for diagnosing problems. So you can uh, check the fidelity of your overhang to look for maybe incorrect ligations that can be holding your assemblies back. It's also really good for uh, designing new assembly standards or modifying existing standards. Uh, and then kind of the last thing that has come out recently from NEB is the AnyBridge ligase master mix. Uh, so this is kind of a kit that was developed that allows you to use all of the commonly, uh, all the common type 2S enzymes uh, with kind of a single single enzyme mix. So that contains the, the ligase and all the reaction components you need for the assembly. You just add the type 2S enzyme you want to use and, and you're off. Uh, so it really simplifies it. It cuts down on the number of components that you have to keep on hand. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those great resources, um, the tools and the products with our listeners. We'll make sure we put links in the transcript um, for this podcast to all of those resources so that our listeners can find them easily. I was curious if you have kind of an interesting story that you could share um, about one of our customers' experiences related to Golden Gate. So a lot of this technology is still relatively new, so things are just really starting to develop kind of the most probably high profile thing that's come out using a lot of uh, the, the tools that we've put out there is this is paper called Fraggler uh, from, I believe, AstraZeneca. And uh, they kind of use the, the tools that we built to build this, this platform that allows them to do these combinatorial assemblies internally. And I think this is the first, but I have no doubt that this won't be the last. I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of things built on top of uh, some of this ligase fidelity work uh, coming out in the future. Yeah, that's great. I can't wait to see what our collaborators come out with next. Okay, Andy, before I let you go, what are your top three tips for someone new to performing any bridge Golden Gate assembly? 
So the, the three most important things somebody can do is check your assembly design, double check your assembly design, and then triple check your assembly design uh, before you even start doing anything at the bench. Um, spending that, you know, kind of in silico time, making sure that your assembly is exactly what you want. You're making the parts that you think you want before you, you know, order primers and, and do a PCR is going to save you a lot of a lot of time because even, you know, internally we have cases where we think we have everything ironed out the assembly fails and then we have to go back through and try to figure out what happened and it's usually just we missed a nucleotide somewhere we we made a mistake in some part of the assembly and so spending that that extra you know couple hours to go through and just really make sure that you have exactly what you want will save you a lot of headache and a lot of time uh, later on kind of the other issues that come up a lot is missing internal recognition sites um, so if you you know fail to properly domesticate uh, the sequences that you're working with, your your products are all going to get cleaved at the end of the reaction and you're really not going to get anything. Kind of another common one is just not checking the fidelity of the assembly. So, you know, we see this a lot going through and just using the, the any bridge tools online and making sure that the assembly overhangs that you're using are, are giving you what you want can make a huge difference. You know, we see a lot of tech cases come through where somebody has just missed something like they put a palindromic overhang in their sequence and that'll just completely kill your fidelity uh, of the assembly. Other things you can do is use good protocols. NEV has spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of our development scientists have put a lot of time and quite a few years into developing the the enzymes, the buffers, and the protocols used um, in Golden Gate assemblies and they give really good results. So follow the recommendations. Um, and finally, DNA quality. Um, this is one that I think gets overlooked a lot. Making sure that you do your PCRs, you make sure that they're as good as you can possibly get them and then clean them up properly before quantifying them and then and then using them in the reaction can make a big, big difference. You know, we have some data where, you know, just having one contaminated part in an assembly can completely ruin the assembly efficiency and drop it by a thousand fold. Wow, that's a big drop. Okay, folks, you heard it here first. Check your assembly design before proceeding. Super important. And also, don't be afraid to reach out to NEB's knowledgeable technical support staff if you have any questions. If you are new to Golden Gate Assembly and you need a hand, um, you need guidance beyond the online tools we offer and the online protocols we offer, you can always reach out to NEB technical support at info at neb.com. Or you can find our technical support form on our website www.neb.com. Thank you so much for joining me today, Andy. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners will learn a lot. And uh, I hope everybody goes and checks out the helpful resources that Andy's helped provide. And um, I wish you success in your future Golden Gate assemblies. Thank you. Uh, it was great talking to you and good luck on your assemblies too, listeners. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast. I'd like to take a moment to remind you where to find some of the helpful resources we mentioned in this conversation. Head over to our website, neb.com, to find video tutorials and webinars, as well as the answers to some questions our tech support team is frequently asked. 